a webinar by the European Student Chapter of APLIS. Um, and we have three very experienced reviewers as guests today, as speakers, and I hope they can give you um, yeah, a lot of advice and tips on how we can improve our manuscripts and uh, they will tell us about um, common pitfalls and shortcomings. Yeah, and I'm very, to happy, very happy to have you here, you three, today. And now I would like to introduce you to our um, webinar procedure. So we will have Professor Dr. Isabella Peters as our first speaker. She's from the um, EBV Leibniz Information Center for Economics and the Kiel University of Germany. And uh, our second speaker is Professor Dr. Jude Leipzig from the Amsterdam School of Communication Research at the University of Amsterdam. And our third speaker will be Professor Dr. Dirk Lewandowski from the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences in Germany. And um, all of them uh, will, tell, <laughs> will tell us about uh, her review experience, uh, the review activity, give us some key advice from their perspective. And as you might have noticed, I asked you to send us um, your most urgent quest questions prior to this webinar. So I forwarded your questions um, to our three speakers and they will answer them. And um, if there are any additional questions or comments you would like to discuss, um, feel free to do so at the end of this webinar. So we will leave some time um, after our three talks for that. Okay, so uh, then I would like to introduce Professor uh, Peters from the EBV and uh, University of uh, Kiel. So uh, she is a professor of web science and her research uh, focuses on social media and web 2.0. Science 2.0 is all scholarly comedy communication on the social web, altmetrics, knowledge management and information retrieval. And uh, yeah, she reviews for a couple of international journals, um, among others for the Plus One, the Journal of the American Society of Information Science and Technology, the Athlet Journal of Information Management. Um, and I'm very happy to tell you that she recently was honored with the Best Review Award, award by the Web Science uh, conference 2016. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation and giving the opportunity to talk to you about um, this very special topic. And in order to not uh, lose more time, I try to start right away. Um, I guess I started reviewing some time ago. Um, I believe it's 2007, but I'm not sure. Um, I did several things, um, and um, surely I did many, many reviews. I can't even count them. Um, I was invited for being a reviewer, and I also serving as um, editor and program chair, um, where you also do reviews um, quite often. And it's not that you uh, always have to review this uh, similar types of documents, but it's quite a variety of things you have to review. And I gave you this um, short list of um, what I've done so far. So it's basically journal papers, but also book proposals, of course, um, several theses, and also grant proposals. So there's a lot of um, things um, going on when you do uh, reviewing. Um, my key advice for students is kind of a combination um, of two things um, when you try to get your um, paper published. Um, the first part of a successful article is, of course, the excellent manuscript. And But you know, just having an excellent manuscript doesn't help at all. You also have to get read. And um, so I will give you an advice also how um, you will get read. But first, what should you do when you want to um, have an excellent article. My first advice is to um, go to the journal or the um, conference of, or the, the venue you would like to publish and search if they have some kind of reviewer guidelines because the reviewer guidelines will tell the reviewers 
what they should be looking for when they read the articles, other articles which are submitted. And some of these reviewer guidelines are pretty specific and pretty extensive um, explaining um, what journals are looking for and what is what makes a good article. So this is very helpful and I gave you some um, uh, examples here and also links um, which you can use when you get the slides afterwards. Um, again, um, as we have uh, seen before, there are certain uh, um, several types of documents um, which can be sent to journals and sometimes um, journals also have um, specific guidelines for uh, specific types of articles, for example, for reviews. And um, yeah, by just checking these questions, um, which you can see on the right hand side, um, it, it's very helpful to, to craft your article according to these guidelines. Um, the second advice um, for having an excellent manuscript and getting hopefully published is the structure, um, which is pretty important in papers then, because uh, in the end, the structure is what people will see first, it's what um, will help um, readers to um, go through your article and also to um, get a hold on what is your argumentation. Commonly, um, you can use the MRAT um, structure, or, um, which represents um, introduction methods, results, and discussion. Or you can also have some kind of longer version of this MRAT uh, structure, which is introduction, literature review, methods, results, discussion, and conclusion. So basically, all of the um, papers you will see and you read will have some kind of structure like that. Of course, um, you should align your efforts in structuring your paper according to your discipline, your field, or the journal convention. However, I pasted um, this very nice and long um, uh, citation or quote um, to the, um, into the slides, um, also for that you can refer to it afterwards. But it basically says that um, a good article um, it's very good in explaining what is the contribution of the article and how it relates to um, former and um, future um, research. So this is your task, what you have to do, explain very clearly what's your contribution and give context so that um, readers and reviewers can um, evaluate at your article on the basis of, of that. Um, the next, next thing, or the, the third advice I have for you, is the advantage of being open. And this is now the key advice um, for um, getting read. Um, so not having an excellent manuscript now, but um, getting read. And um, what we can see here is evidence that being open, um, publishing papers online and for free, and also providing the data boost your chances to um, get cited. And in the end, this is what you want to, um, <laughs> you know, this is what you want to receive uh, as an academic, um, as a scholar aiming for tenure and so on. So uh, my advice is um, um, it's nice um, to have an, an excellent article, but when no one reads it, then yeah, it's um, just useless. So make sure that you have a very nice article and also make sure that you um, that others can access it and can read it. And I'm sure um, the other presenters will talk a little bit more about the openness of research. Um, let me turn now to the um, question you asked me. And they were quite difficult, but I tried to give my best to give you some advice on these. Um, the, the first question I received was how to approach a call for papers. Call for papers are quite common um, for conferences um, seeking you know, contributions, but you can also find call for papers for journals, special issues, book chapters, and um, whatsoever. So there's quite a variety going on there. Um, when you see this call for paper and you have to decide whether you should submit something, you could surely go to 
um, to rankings and find out whether the conference, for example, um, is a good one and whether it makes sense to submit something. Um, what you typically should consider is the target group of the conference or the journal um, and um, because this will give you an idea of um, how the paper should be structured and what should the topic uh, be. Um, you can also have a look on the ed editorial board and program committee to find out what might, their, might be their interest or the focus um, of um, the journal special issue, for example, and so they can adjust um, your manuscript. Um, of course, you can ask yourself, okay, um, what's the publisher, um, how visible um, is the publisher, um, that does the publisher offer open access versions um, of published articles. So this might, might all also play a role when deciding whether to submit. Of course, <coughs> the topic is quite important um, uh, and is the basis for every um, for every um, article, um, so you have to align your um, article to the topics that are mentioned in the call for papers. And you should be able to demonstrate the relationship and the importance of your contribution and align it with this call for papers. Um, another um, thing which you could um, consider is when you want to submit something to a call for papers is whether you need feedback um, because this is a good opportunity. Um, usually um, journal special issues or conferences have the people who are really knowledgeable in a field as reviewers and if you would like to have feedback on something you should submit your article and then you will get feedback. And whether it might be negative or positive, it always helps. Um, well, another thing to decide, of course, is um, is the length of the article okay for me? Is the deadline suitable for me? Can I manage to submit it on time? And so on. So this is how, or these are all aspects that you have to consider when you um, see a call for papers. The next question is quite a, a nice one um, um, because it asks um, how to get my research article, the correct title, should it be catchy, should it be short, should it be long. And um, I'm, I'm sure that Lute can um, later explain more on the relationship between um, uh, the length of titles and its uh, probability to, to um, getting cited. But I wanted to um, refer to um, work done by Stasha Milojevic, a colleague from um, Indiana University, um, and she had a look at um, journal titles, and she differentiated between three types of journal titles, oh, not journal titles, excuse me, the, the research um, article titles, and um, she found that um, there are titles that already describe the main findings or conclusions um, which are um, in the article, um, or there are descriptive titles, um, which kind of really just describe what's going on in the article, but do not, you know, tell um, the result. Um, or, and this is quite common, um, to have um, article title with a question. Um, funny enough, um, um, they found out that um, articles which were published in the field of astronomy um, are basically um, the longer, the younger the um, authors are, um, and also the more papers um, you, you have written, so the more productive you are, also the longer the, pa the, longer the paper titles get. So it's like, it's really funny. Um, paper titles which have a question in it um, are most common um, among people who are very productive, so who published a lot, and also among um, big research groups. So this is also a nice um, finding here. But to summarize, um, the title of an article is something like a hook in the information flood. I mean, this is what people will read when they search for it. This is what how they will um, decide whether they want to read this, um, whether they want to buy this article. So it's it's worthwhile to um, really think about how to construct 
art, uh, the article title. Um, in the end, you should go for the aboutness um, of the paper, which should go into the article title. Um, I, I like to think about the title as a tiny abstract of what's going on in the paper. Of course, it increases findability and it's an attention trigger. And um, I share with you here one example of a paper who got a lot of attention in um, all social media sources. And as you can see, it's quite a funny um, title, um, you know, raising curiosity in, in the people um, on social media platforms. And so the reaction was that they um, pretty often tweeted that. So this is, but this is the outcome um, when you try to be uh, sketchy, for example. The next question was um, whether it's a disadvantage to cite German articles or any other um, foreign languages in an English written paper. Um, I guess that's a common problem or a common question. Um, honestly, I have no experience at all <laughs> um, when considering this question. Maybe the other presenters can tell us something about that. Um, what I would advise is that you please refer to the journal guidelines, what they say about this case. Um, I would also say that it's not a problem when um, you have some kind of balanced ratio between you know, English, um, English papers and foreign language papers um, in your in your, uh, cited in your paper, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, of course, when you use direct quotes in the paper, you have to translate the, um, the, the, the quote into the, the um, language of the paper, um, which can be complicated. Um, but in general, I would you know, advise you to just choose the references with which support your argumentation and make your paper stronger, no matter in what the language they are. But this is my really my personal point of view, as I have no experience here. Um, the fourth question is kind of twofold, because there was an A and a B question. Um, and it asked about when and why to write a book review. Um, well, that's something you can do. It's nice when you have some kind of knowledge about the field, usually when you are maybe in the third year of your PhD program or so, so you have acquired a lot of knowledge and you know what's going on. Um, the nice thing is when you, you know, <laughs> do a big book review, you, you usually get the book for free from the publisher, so that's a nice, nice thing. Um, book reviews usually look for a critical and personal assessment of the content of the book. So it's really that you have to do some kind of objective um, assessment um, first, but on the other hand, it's like they want to hear your voice, they want to know so what do you think about that? And what's, what makes it a, a good book um, in a certain area? Or what distinguishes it from, from other works in this area? So you can go personal, but you, know, you have to, to present your personal opinion on that. And it's not that you should assault the authors or so. So it's not this way of being personal. Um, what to um, achieve with it when you're doing a book review, because I mean, this will take some time, of course. You will pretty much become visible in the community, but do not expect to get any credit for that. This is um, doing book reviews. They have no relevance for tenure for nothing. It's just for fun, basically. Um, a letter to the editor, um, I would say, is quite different. Um, usually, you would write it to the editor um, when you want to respond to an already published paper. Um, most of the times, letters to the editors um, offer some critical reflection or feedback or clarification of this published um, paper. But also, sometimes they do some kind of reinforcement or provide additional views, additional material. Um, some people like to think about um, letter to the editors as forms of post-publication peer review, which is openly published. Um, so it will include your name, 
next camp. It will be um, jointly published with the um, paper criticized, so be aware of that, that this can happen. Um, and the advice would be that um, a letter to the editor will give you a pretty high visibility in the community and among the readership of the journal, for example. You should do this right after the publication of the original paper, so it doesn't make sense to um, send in a response, you know, um, half a year later. Um, the letter to the editor can start um, uh, the discussion among peers, which can be good. Um, and what I think is that you can get credit for it. So it's not um, just for fun what you do this, but because you're becoming pretty visible, you can also get credit for it if, if the letter for the editor, the critics, and all that stuff in it is well done. Um, the last uh, um, question I had was about cover letter. Um, what should get in this and how important it is. Um, and my experience is that in a cover letter you should state or you should talk about the relevance of your paper for the journal and the target group. So point, point out again your contribution. Tell the editors what's new, why they should accept this. It's um, surely more than just the abstract um, because you really try to relate your work to um, to uh, the target group um, of the journal and you will try to make clear um, what's the benefit for the journal to accept your paper. Um, what I can see is that a um, uh, cover letter is even more important, maybe not for the first round of um, uh, publishing papers, but maybe after the first round of review, so where you have, then you have to um, answer the questions from the reviewers and um, have to make clear how you address the reviewer comments and make clear what changes you made. So I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Isabella. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we might We'll discuss a few aspects at the end yeah. again. For example, you uh, said question two should be maybe answered or added uh, by the other speakers. So I hope we have a little bit time at the end to uh, do so. So then I would like to uh, proceed with our next speaker, um, Professor Dr. Lee Bladesdorf. Um, he is a professor in the dynamics of scientific communication and technological innovation at the University of Amsterdam. And um, his research focuses on the fields of system theory and social network analysis, scientometrics, and the social, sociology of innovation. And uh, he has not only published extensively on this topic, he's also on the editorial boards of several journals. Uh, so, for example, uh, the scientometrics, the social science information. Cybermetrics, the Journal of Infometrics, and he received the Derek de Solar Prize Award for Scientometrics in 2003. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to welcome you here, Professor uh, Leitdorf. And yeah, it's your turn. Thank you, Saya. I hope everybody can hear me. How to choose? Uh, I, I'm ju I just decided to follow the questions which were asked to me by uh, Sarah. And the first question I was supposed to answer is, how to choose the right journal for my paper. And I think the central message is, it's not you choosing a journal, of course, that's also the case, but it is the journals choosing you. Yeah, so you, and that you have to be reflexively aware of. It's not so important that you send your message uh, and that you make your choice, as well as to think about particularly in our field, because pe people are very savvy about journals in information science, uh, that you should be aware of where do I link into the discussion? Where do I, can I be received? Why would it be interesting for people to read this? And, and even beyond that, why would it be interested, interesting to be cited? Yeah? In which context would it be interesting? So. I know it's very difficult and sometimes it's uh, 
it's painful and sometimes it's in, even not possible. But so if you think about, for example, in 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 my narrow area, you can think of a manuscript which I can send to Scientomatics or the Journal of the American Society of Information Science. Then I think about the Journal of the American Society of Information Science to give a concrete example. It's also read by many librarians, so I better send there my papers which have also a non-quantitative aspect to it. So uh, maybe it's too, too abstract, but I, I just want to make the, the central point that we have a tendency to report, to send, yeah? And that's not important. It is important in communication to be received. Having said this, it remains that you have to make a choice. And my advice would also be to go for your academic ambition and only make concessions afterwards. So if you're a sociologist, of course, you want to publish in the American Journal of Sociology, but that's not feasible. Nevertheless, uh, and I, when I was young, I also boldly sent my manuscripts there. And you have to pay an author fee or something like that. And nevertheless, what is the surplus value of it is that you get in the turnaround, you get excellent referee comments. So if you send your paper to a top journal, you, you sometimes get excellent referee comments, which enable you to improve your paper so that you can send it to a next order journal. It's just, it's abusing the system a bit. But anyhow, uh, it's most important, I think, to think of a second best or a third best option all the time. So to set pros and cons against each other and also to take into account that for irrational reasons you may run into a referee who doesn't like who didn't like your paper, so that you have to make uh, so that you are rejected. The rejection happens to all of us. Uh, Dirk is going to say more about that. Uh, don't. Uh, it's not that bad to be rejected because there are more journals in our fields. Uh, actually, in our fields, there are many journals and. Uh, I sometimes, uh, I'm somewhat older, so uh, I try to avoid stress uh, for health reasons. So I sometimes send my paper after, after that it is twice rejected, I send it to uh, a lower order journal, and I'm happy with that. But I, I know if you are in a career situation, you have, of course, to go on. Uh, very important for me, it seems to be, uh, as an advice, to remain in your own domain, yeah? Because you have a specialist lingo, which people beyond the domain will not understand, and it will lead to rejection, and sometimes to desk rejection. I once had a paper sent to an economics journal, and I got in return, it's a good paper, but it should be rejected, because it's not written by an economist. So that can happen to you. Okay, the next question is, as a young researcher, what is best, aim to the stars or to the three tops? Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but there is no answer to what is best. Uh, uh, it's difficult. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you have to make choices, yeah, and you ha may have afterwards thought that you have made the wrong choice, but anyhow, in the context of a whole career, yeah, you sometimes lose months, and sometimes that's very painful and unpleasant, particularly if you have something which becomes older. But everybody is suffering from that, yeah. So, yeah, the system is imperfect. Nevertheless, people are doing their best to make it. Uh, I thought that I should give uh, it more or less relates to uh, Isabella's uh, uh, talk, that paper about. Uh, for Suchala Belt, which we did specifically on an invitation of them, in which we say more about publishing in German and publishing in English, and how the two relate. And you may find it interesting to take a look at that, particularly if you are keeping a portfolio both in English and in German. Uh, in Holland, Dutch is not a language like German, of course. In Holland, I think everybody has moved to English and in Scandinavian countries as well, in Switzerland, or 
But, but Austria and Germany, of course, and France are a different story. Uh, so we, we elaborated on that in the sociological case in this paper. Oh, I have to push a button here. Should one go for only refereed or also unrefereed journals? I would say refereeing is not even if, uh, sufficient. You have to go for listed journals. That means that they have to have an impact factor and to be part of the web of science. I, before I go to unlisted journals, I would at least try, try, try it twice. Yeah. Uh, if it takes too long in the review process, don't hesitate to ask for progress. You can just ask for, please drop me a line. Many, pa many journals nowadays also have uh, systems where you can follow the progress on your paper. Uh, but I think the top level is the journals which I have impact factors. These are more readily accessible for the community of researchers. Of course, you have open access. That's a different business model. Uh, I'm not sure. Of, and as far as they are open access and, and, and have an impact factor, of course, that's even better. But uh, the system is conserved. So in terms of building your symbolic capital, to take a word from Bourdieu, it's important to be in the, it's an elite system, to be part of that elite as soon as possible. And so the top layer, you have some papers in that top layer, and I would say uh, don't waste time for other purposes. Uh, of course, you may be in a situation that you want to send a letter to the editor, but make a careful deliberation, everything. Time is your short thing. Um, you can time change time not in money. Uh, time is not money. Uh, the other way around. Money cannot make time. Sometimes it can. Okay, I go to my next slide. Uh, that's the last one. Is there a difference in the reviewing process of journals or conference articles? Um, I, I repeat, build up your own symbolic capital. That's a long-term goal, and it means that you orient yourself towards the global, do global dimension. And it's not so important if your department is organizing a uh, nice day where they give presentations to each other. That's all fine, and, but it is also old-fashioned. It, uh, it gives a good feeling, and you have a nice lunch together. But the important thing is to build your reputation beyond the department, beyond the national borders, to be part of the international community. And in order to do that, uh, the main thing which you have to ask you, and there I return to the beginning of my speech, uh, how do I link up to the literature so that it is worse for others to see do? And I want to add one more thing. I would also always use preprint service like SSRN, or uh, we have also eList, but I don't know if it's so active, so that people have access to your preprint version. And uh, yeah, of course, if it's open access, that's not necessary. But I think these are the main points I want to make today. Main point to repeat is be very aware and very reflexive about not sending, also in the style you use, do not use the, the past tense, but use the present tense, because you're not reporting, you're not writing a report, you are trying to make an argument. And that argument should convince your readership, so you have to tune into your readership. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, and I would also ask you all to keep your questions and comments uh, for the end. I introduce you to our last speaker, Professor Dr. Dirk Lewandowski from the Hamburg University of Applied Science, and he's a professor of information research and information retrieval there. Uh, he's an expert, expert for, uh, for in-web information retrieval.
he will search engine user behavior and um, yeah, he also studies the role that search engines play in the society. And he is the editor of the Asset Journal of Information Management as well as an associate editor of the Online Information Review. And uh, yeah, he only he also uh, yeah is a review of various journals. So I'm very, very happy to welcome you, uh, Professor Lewandowski. And yeah, it's now your turn. Thank you very much. I'll try to be brief because we only have a quarter of an hour left. Um, you already introduced me. Um, I'm the editor of Asset Journal of Information Management, as you said which is an international and uh, ISI-ranked uh, information science journal. Uh, some people still know it under the title ASLIP Proceedings. Um, we changed the title two or three years ago. I'm also the associate editor for Online Information Review, another international ISI-ranked information science journal. And I did edit some books and um, I would say it, it may be worth uh, writing book chapters, but that's a different topic, I think. Um, Sure, surely I'm also a reviewer and an author, so I try to um, take in the different perspectives, but my main perspective today will be um, the editor's perspective. So a few words about um, the ASLIP journal. Um, it is an information science journal. We accept, um, well, articles in um, all areas of information science, but we have a focus on information management. And what is maybe more important to you is um, that what well, our aim is to try to provide the best services. This is what everybody says, more or less. Um, and we want to provide the best services to authors and readers as well. So for authors, authors may, uh, the, the um, best service is mainly good peer review experience, which means in our case, we want to provide fast, rigorous and constructive peer review. So fast means uh, you will usually have a decision uh, within six weeks after submission. Uh, it means uh, we're rigorous. You will get uh, three reviewer reports. We have a high rejection rate, which is um, quite normal for such a journal. But don't worry, we got a lot of submissions that are off topic. So um, uh, things that are actually on topic, we have a much lower re rejection rate. And what I want to stress is uh, that the journal is double blind peer reviewed, which means that um, the reviewers don't see who you are, which may be an advantage if you submit as a student. And our, our reviews should be uh, constructive. This is something um, I, as an editor, uh, take care of. And um, so the re reviewers' comments should always be helpful, even if your paper is rejected. And I think this is very important, and uh, Lud already stressed it, that, um, submit, that you, if you submit to the top journals, you get good reviewer reports and you can improve your paper uh, from that. So straight to the four questions um, I was asked to answer. Uh, the first one on choosing co-authors, uh, the question was, what is better, a solo author paper, a national co-author collaboration paper, or an international collaboration paper? Well, it really shouldn't matter because um, when you submit to a double-blind peer review journal, um, nobody sees uh, how many authors have written the paper uh, and who um, are the authors actually. But still, um, it will help you to, co uh, to have experienced co-authors because uh, they have experience and you can profit from their knowledge and experience. But please avoid honorary authorships, which means don't um, um, take in your, your PhD advisor as an author if you didn't do anything. Uh, that's really scientific misbehavior and you shouldn't do it. Uh, it will not increase your chances of getting uh, accepted. The second question, uh, which is quite a tricky one, is um, how to pre uh, reply to reviewers' remarks, what not to do. So what you should do uh, when you submit your revision is to provide a detailed report on the changes and additions you made in response to the reviewer's comments. I will show you an example in a few seconds. But two hints on what you shouldn't do. Don't argue with the reviewers. You could argue, you can argue with the editor instead. Um, if you have questions or think, um, well, a reviewer is biased or um, you don't agree with the reviewer, first um, ask the editor. And, um, well, there may be um, a possibility to clarify things. 
The second one um, is um, sometimes a bit hard to understand, but I would say don't fulfill a reviewer's requests if you are not convinced. Uh, reviewers often say, um, well, you should increase the sample size, you should uh, do whatever, and it may not be feasible. So um, consider the reviewer's comments, um, answer all uh, the comments, but you don't have to do anything a reviewer wants you to do. So um, this is a very important um, advice, I think. I think. When you reply to reviewers, you should um, give a list of the revisions. On the left-hand side, you see kind of a, uh, a summary where uh, the author, um, well, uh, this is um, just um, a part of um, the answer. So uh, it's in this case, um, answers to two reviewers, and it's a bit more general than the one on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, the author just says um, what he has done to improve the paper. On the right-hand side, um, every comment uh, from the reviewers is taken into account and we have a response to, um, to every um, comment. It really doesn't matter in which way you do it because uh, you can use track changes in the manuscript so our reviewers and the editor will uh, see what you have changed. Um, so it's kind of um, a matter of personal style. The third question is about um, what to do if my paper was rejected. First of all, don't cry. We all get rejected sometimes. Nobody talks about it, or we only talk about it seldomly. Uh, what you should do is sleep over it and then appreciate the value valuable feedback you hopefully got. And this is really, um, I think, a, a good quality metric for a journal, that the feedback is actually valuable that you get not just a decision or oh, didn't like the paper, it should be rejected. A good reviewer should give you feedback on how to improve your paper, even if he recommends to reject it. And um, after considering the feedback, you should decide whether to rework the paper or you call it quits and sometimes, um, well, it will not help. What I really like is, and I think um, it would be a good uh, key performance indicator for journals, uh, is that um, when you have a paper rejected and still um, think the feedback is very good. This is um, an excerpt from, from an email I got from an author who said, thank you for your feedback and I apologize for not replying earlier. I was not sulking. Although I would prefer acceptance of an article, the comment feedback is very fair and detailed. Please thank the reviewers for the time, for the time they put into this. So this is what really um, well, uh, peer review should be about, even if you get rejected, you get good comments and know how to improve your paper. The last question was about green open access. So can I upload my published paper to ResearchGate, Academia, etc.? Uh, here, the publishers usually allow you to upload a preprint version, which is green open access, uh, but they do not allow you to upload the version of record. And uh, there is a trend towards more liberal open access policies. So usually it shouldn't be a problem to have a preprint version uploaded to um, whatever um, platform you like. If you are unsure about um, whether a journal accepts um, that you upload your, your, your preprint, you can consider the Sherpa Romeo database. And you see an example here. This is for the Asset Journal of Information Management and you can see that it's allowed to post uh, the preprint and also uh, the postprint, but you're not allowed if you publish in this journal to um, publish the um, publisher's version, which is uh, the publisher's PDF. Um, I think I should skip that because um, we don't have too much time. And uh, I was asked for three advices. I just want to give you one. Maybe all of you know uh, this cartoon from the New Yorker on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And if you submit a paper, choose a double-blind peer review uh, journal because in double-blind peer review, nobody knows you're a student. If you do good uh, scholarship, your chances of getting accepted are very high. Thank you. And um, I have another question. So, um... Because our latest dog told us uh, that we should uh, 
the several journals or maybe also reject rejections as a chance and uh, submit our manuscripts to other journals. But I could imagine that this can be this can be a very long process. So um, how long should I wait for answers from uh, yeah journals that I submitted my manuscript to, or um, how many journals should I try to hand in my manuscript? How when sh maybe should I say oh that's enough? Um, my research is too old now. Yeah, also bad journals in information science. I think. Um, uh, the um, Elsevier journals have a nice feature on the website where you can actually see how long peer review takes uh, usually and um, you can see that some journals take ages and some um, only a few, few weeks and I would recommend at least um, considering the trade-off between high quality journals and um, uh, fast peer review. I see we have a question from uh, the with a page limit for journals. It is it is hard to explain everything in detail in a 10-page paper. Isabella, please. Yeah. <laughs> I agree, Luz. I agree. And it's just your, you know, as an author, it's just your task to get, uh, to get a, a good paper into 10 pages. And if you would like to have it in nature or science or somewhere else, um, you even have less papers um, to fill. So you have to be clear and very concise about your argument your argument and you have to know what's your contribution and then it should be possible to um, write a short paper about it but I agree with Lute it's, it's, it's so much tougher to write a short paper than a long one. But really you should uh, stick to the limits. I get lots of emails uh, where authors say well, you have an um, 8,000 word limit uh, for journal papers, um, but I have a really great uh, research project and the paper is 20,000 words long. Uh, well, um, you should focus on, on the main findings, you should focus on what really is new and interesting. I, I would say well, you should be able to, to put that in an 8,000 words paper. Well, if there are no the questions I to, um, yeah, to point out that we uh, would like to ask you to participate in the European Student Chapter. So our next board elections um, are in October 2016 and all students who are interested in that um, feel free to contact us and to inform uh, us uh, when you want to participate. There are a few positions, um, a few fixed ones, as well as optional positions, so there's the chair, the vice chair, the secretary, and we also have uh, the newsletter editor, the social media manager, as well as the webmaster, but um, it depends on what you want to do uh, when you would like uh, to become part of our board. And you can um, yeah, join our mailing list to stay informed about our activities. And yeah, that's everything from, from me so that's it for today and I uh, have to say many thanks to our speakers um, yeah, I was happy to have you here and I think it was very very informative and you uh, gave us, us very valuable advice and uh, yeah I hope we will see you next time and um, I also have to thank our students for their questions very tough one sometimes yeah and uh, thanks and uh, Goodbye.